Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Fact Discussion. The time every Thursday where we seek the fact of the truth of God's Word into our lives and hopefully into your life as well. We do this every Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. And I guess with daylight savings time kicking in, it would technically be daylight savings times. But anyway, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. We come together to study the Word of God. And the people that I enjoy studying with are these guys right here. Now, Bob, don't take offense. He's not with us today, so I'm not trying to exclude Bob, but I enjoy studying the Bible with him as well. Um, but we, we enjoy getting together to do this, and we enjoy you being with us as well. We really appreciate your comments, your thoughts, your questions, your participation. If you'd like to participate in our study, you can do it via the live stream on our Facebook page or the live stream on our YouTube channel. We're streaming both there, both locations. Feel free to join in that way. If you would like to email us, you can send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Questions at truthfactorlive.com. So let's go ahead and jump right into our study. Gentlemen, we had co we'd covered so far, John chapter four up to verse 38, we'd been talking about the woman at the well in Jesus's conversation with her. Where we're going to be picking up, and I'll have Brendan, who has finally decided to join us today, <laughs> um, to finish up the section of 39 through 42. And he's given a lot of thought and prayer over the matter, and he switched now to the New King James Version. Um, hey, I, I want to ramble real quick. There, there was a bee in my bonnet. I, I want to ramble for just a moment. Um, I believe that we should pray. And I think we should pray when we have difficult decisions to make. But I have known individuals who make a decision that doesn't seem right. But I prayed about it. I prayed a lot about that decision. You know, this woman is thinking, I don't love my husband anymore. Should I leave him? So she prays about it. And two months later, I prayed a lot about this. And, and, and it's got to be the right decision to leave him. Um, just because we pray about something doesn't mean our end conclusion will be the right decision. Don't say that to justify something that you've done. See, way out there, thought was on my mind. Any thoughts about that before we jump into the woman at the Brendan. Woman? Well, Brendan. I feel like that was about <laughs> Brendan. Uh, there was no prayer about switching to this <laughs> translate. No. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a good point. It, it's always a good point. You know, we, you, you, we, the, our country has certain phrases that we tend to use them as a sticker or a whitewasher machine. That's a phrase I could use to yep. bless something that God wouldn't bless. Oh, I prayed on it. I feel the Lord's calling me. The Holy Spirit told me. You know, I, I will always bring up this quote. John Piper, who believes in modern day miracles, one, one time said in a sermon, I hear people say the Holy Spirit would tell X, Y, and Z and said, if the Holy Spirit's going to tell you anything outside the word, it's, I gave you a book. Why aren't you using it? <laughs> and I bring that up because yeah. here's a guy who believes in modern day miracles and he still says, go with the book. Go with the book. Yeah, that's right. So God's never going to tell you to go against his word, to do something that is clearly, clearly condemned in scripture. Yeah. So saying that you prayed on it, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Uh, saying the Holy Spirit told you, that doesn't mean anything if it doesn't line up with God's word. It just might make you feel better about your decision. Yeah. All right. And so someone. That, oh, oops. What's that? Well, I was just going to add to that. Sometimes we pray not to be heard by God, but to sue their own conscience. But we got to check our motivations. Are are we actually wanting an answer from God? Sometimes we're just praying over the same things over and over again just to hear ourselves talk about it. We got to yeah. think about that. All right. I think it's a good point. That's a point. Well, speaking of praying over something, I don't know if the woman at the well prayed whether or not about going to the well that day. But something good happened. And we've been spending some time talking about her conversation with Jesus um, I do terrible segues, by the way, so I just throw that out there. Um, but I'm going to start with verse 39. And Brendan, if you would read for us verses 39 through 42, and let's kind of finish up and cap off this part of our study. John chapter 4, 
39 through 42 from the New King James Version. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Okay. Thank you, Brendan. So any final thoughts on this? Um, we, we, we talked about this a little bit last week, but we see people who believe because of her reporting of what he had done, but others who believe because they saw with their own eyes or heard with their own ears. Any thoughts about that? One little maybe tangential point as far as the, the uniqueness of the Bible and its reliability. We see here the general attitude that people had in the first century regarding the testimony of women. You see here in verse 42, even if these had come because the woman told them something about Jesus, they didn't want to give her any credit that, oh, we believe because of your testimony. No, we believe because we heard Jesus. But I want, I'm, how this brings in is we see that the first witnesses of the resurrection were women. And we see that women have a role to play in the propagation of the gospel. Now, not to the usurping of God's plan, we would all agree on that. But we see that God values women equally as men. And here, this woman, yes, she was the one that got the men and everybody else to come out to Jesus. So the others who maybe were a little bit skeptical could hear Jesus. But I think this is just a reminder that God uses anyone for his purposes. And he doesn't play favorites as one being inherently better than the other. Uh, he has roles. He has a structure. There's an order of things that we have to submit to and follow. However, here we see again that you know, this, is, this is a very unique exchange. One, Jesus as a Jewish man is interacting with a Samaritan woman. That never happened. Uh, he's a man interacting with a woman out in public. Again, that was not customary. It's our point here, too, that we see Jesus often and routinely going to the people who are rejected and ostracized by society because it's those people who need the gospel the most. So two points there, and uh, there's my thoughts. You know, uh, yeah, just, just building on that, the verse 34, now we believe, that, that just brings back the reminder that we sometimes talk about how faith needs to be your own. You know, some somebody else can introduce it to you, but eventually you have to reach the point where it's your faith. And uh, you, you see the example of that in, in these individuals. So I think that's a uh, that's just an observation because because I always use this as an example of evangelism. You know, there's there's a lot of points tied to that, but eventually somebody's got to figure it out for themselves. Yeah. So that's a good point. All right, any other thoughts or comments? Someone commented earlier about a white dot over me. For some reason, my screen capture is picking up my mouse movements. <laughs> so I had my mouse sitting over one of my, my monitors there that has where I'm picking my image up from. Um, okay. Lessons regarding evangelism. So... If we try to teach somebody and we can't convince them, okay, we're trying to study with them, but, and we spend several weeks studying with them and they just don't see it. Should our feelings been hurt, be hurt when maybe two years later, someone else comes in and studies with them, maybe from the same congregation and they're able to show them the truth in such a way that they're convicted. Shouldn't hurt our feelings. No, no pride there. I mean, whatsoever. Sometimes that seed being planted takes a bit of watering in order for it to, to come forth. And that's kind of like this. Some people were convinced by what the woman said, but others said, but we believe because of what we heard as well from him. And so sometimes it takes more than just your saying so to convince someone. It takes something more. So, all right. 
that being the case, let's continue forward here with the next section. Um, we have Jesus now departing over into Galilee. And so we'll spend just a moment looking at that, see if there's any background. Um, and then we'll get into the healing of the noble son. So, Paul, would you mind reading just the three verses there, 43 through 45? Uh, <clears throat> pardon me, pick up at 43? Mm, yes, please. I believe that's right. Yep. Okay. Uh, I will do that. <clears throat> now, after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. All right, so Paul, when we started our story here, this section, what city was Jesus in, going up in the previous discussion there? Uh, well, uh, looking there. A region, I a should city. say. Yeah, he came to a city of Samaria that is called Sychar. Yeah. If I'm saying that right. Okay. And then after two days, he leaves there, goes on down to Galilee. Um, and it's, it's interesting, Paul, he says, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now we've, we've seen that statement before, haven't we? But in a different mm -hmm. context. Yes. Uh, on another occasion, uh, the folks uh, of Nazareth, I believe it was miss out on seeing and experiencing some of the miracles that Jesus did because they uh, only see him as the carpenter's son. Uh, they don't see him as uh, the Christ, the Messiah, the son of God. Uh, they, they don't see him as anything more than that. And so uh, I've heard this, uh, heard that kind of misapplied and abused before about, you know, preachers going home to preach, you know, back to their hometown or maybe a congregation doesn't want a guy who grew up in that congregation to come back and and uh, preach among them or be their uh, regular preacher. And so, uh, and that's really a, a misapplication of that because what Jesus is saying is uh, you really missed out uh, if you would have understood more who Jesus was. Yeah. The Matthew 13. Yes, I, I, was. Yeah. I didn't check the reference, but yes, yeah. I think that's right. I cheated. Oh, I looked oh, at wow. the little cross reference on my Bible program. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's helpful. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It's interesting in this text that, you know, you go to that Matthew 13 and it's also in Mark and Luke, his rejection at Nazareth and, and the way it's written here, you know, it makes the point. The Galileans did receive him on this particular occasion, uh, you know, even even though he had testified that he's often rejected there. Uh, but notice the group that did receive him. Uh, it's those who had been to Jerusalem at the feast and they had observed miracles that he was doing at the feast. If I understand all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast. So more than likely he was he had done some miracles down there. And so they had reason to believe in him, even as they come back to their home country. And that'll become uh, that'll become the foundation of the the nucleus that will support him in Galilee because he spends most of his time in Galilee. I I, I don't remember if we may have made this observation about the Gospel of John as compared to to the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, during his preaching and teaching, focus mostly on Galilee, whereas Jerusalem or uh, John focuses mostly on a handful of occasions when he went to Jerusalem. And uh, uh, that ties into this verse. So I just think that's an interesting thought. Okay. That's a good point. Um, any any other thoughts? Um, Tom, you kind of touched on this. Brian, I was going to throw this at you, but but Tom kind of already has talked about it a little bit. The the, the Jesus' use of this phrase in this particular context, because it seems a little bit out of place. Now, after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet is not that honor his own country. So he came to Galilee. The Galileans received him. 
Um, yeah. Do you have any additional thoughts on that? Well, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, and and again, the when Jesus made the statement, you know, he was talking about Nazareth, but it's kind of interesting. The way that it seems to be presented here is his own country's talking about Judah or Jerusalem. Uh, 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 from the standpoint of he's mm -hmm. left Jerusalem and gone back to Galilee, like I said, you know, one one of the few times that's dealt with um, in, in the Gospel of John. So, uh, and I can I can see it valid as he was rejected. Well, what we know, he was rejected both in Jerusalem or Judah as or Judea as well as in Galilee with various individuals. So I, I just I do see that as kind of an observation here. But well let's throw one thing out I forgot about or not just kind of looking back. If we go back to the beginning of the fourth chapter real quick, kind of jumping into that just a little bit. Therefore when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John um, verse three, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. So he needed to go through Samaria. That may be what we're looking back at. I'm sorry. When yeah. he says he left Judea and departed to go to Galilee, the statement about him, a prophet being, uh, not without honor in his own country may be the reference to why he left Judea to go to Galilee and had to go through Samaria in order right. to get to Galilee. Right. And, and, and bear in mind that Jesus taught a lot that we don't have recorded. Absolutely. You know, and, yeah. and, 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 uh, and when I say that, he probably repeated what he taught one place and he would repeat it at another place and then at another place and so on. So for him to say a prophet is not without honor in his own country would be relevant to say yeah. it twice. Nicodemus, well, later on in this uh, book, uh, he, he talks about... Uh, Talks to the council, I think it is, and uh, he says in verse uh, 51 of chapter 7, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And so I think that's a, a, a better a better attitude rather than reputation, rather than what town he's from, uh, you know, what he looks like, what his history is, you know, anything else. Uh, but let's, let's hear what he says and let's see what he can do. And... Uh, sounds like that there are those as you guys have pointed out a little bit the some of the miracles that that jesus signs that he was going to perform um they're going to evaluate it based on that and uh, i think i think john's the only one who talks to us about nicodemus but uh, i may be wrong about that i think that's right but uh, but he, he's an interesting character uh from the scene early mm -hmm. when he comes to see jesus uh, to this scene and in, in, well, the one that I've jumped to in John seven, and then later on at Jesus's death, he's uh, yeah, uh, interesting guy. Did you ever so in Branson and somewhere up north to the Sight and Sound Theater? They do different plays mm -hmm. slash musicals, and the one they did about Jesus was interesting. Um, they brought out a lot of things that maybe are extra biblical things possibly it was really interesting to watch but terrible ending i mean <laughs> they they went right up to 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 uh paul's or peter acts chapter two and got right up to that what shall we do and repent be baptized and they were like call upon the name of the lord jesus christ and you'll be saved so I thought, oh man but the point is they really highlighted nicodemus's role because you saw him as one of two people that came towards the end to take Jesus's tomb. So you actually saw a face, so to speak, because they brought him in and he was, it was interesting the way they portrayed his character. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate that, Paul. Appreciate that. So Brian, I think you're probably a good one to talk about a nobleman. You know, read the story of the nobleman. We'll start in verse 46 and let's go ahead and read down to the end of the chapter if you would sir glad to do it um <clears throat> gonna be reading about the nobleman from cana and uh john chapter 4 verse 46 so jesus came again to cana of galilee where he had made the water wine and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at capernaum when he heard that jesus had come out to judea and galilee he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death then jesus said to him Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. 
The nobleman said to him, Sir, <clears throat> excuse me, sir, come down before my son dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and he said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said it to him, Your son lives, and he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. All right, appreciate that. So here's an interesting question, Brian. This sounds very familiar, doesn't it? To, uh, a, to a miracle that, that Matthew records. But is it close yeah. enough to be the same? Well, what were your thoughts on that? That's a great question. So in Matthew chapter 8, there's another story uh, where we read about Jesus uh, meeting a centurion. And in that case, the centurion, uh, who could have been, you know, a nobleman or an official, you might say, uh, the centurion uh, asked Jesus to bring about a healing, and Jesus heals that person without going to him. Now, there are some distinctions in that. For example, in the story with the centurion, it's not his son, but a servant. Um, which is a pretty substantial uh, difference between the two. Um, there's nothing in this account uh, here in John, uh, John 4 that would indicate to us that this person who's an official or a nobleman was, was not Jewish, that he was Roman. You know, um, I know, uh, for example, one of my favorite movies is the movie The Gospel of John. And in The Gospel of John, they kind of paint a picture that perhaps this might have been a Roman official, but there's nothing about the text that indicates that that might be the case. So, you know, very well could have been uh, an Israelite that uh, we're talking about here. So there's probably enough different, and I, and I, you and I talked about this briefly before the show, there's probably enough different here that we can say these are probably two different events. Um, one thing is in the, in the story of the centurion, Jesus is rather surprised at the centurion's faith, that the faith of the centurion is that he tells Jesus, you don't need to come. Um, I know you ne merely need to make the order. And of course, Jesus uh, makes makes a comment about his faith. Here, uh, it's Jesus prompting him to say, you know, go your way, go on home, because he's okay. Um, and, uh, rather than the person saying, you don't need to come with me, Jesus. So, yeah, I think there's enough differences in the two accounts that we can conclude that that this is a similar miracle, but not the same miracle. Okay. All right. I thought that was interesting too. Um, the, the other thing is what I thought is in the statement here. I thought he said this twice um, where he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe there, there is that. No, this is the only time I think he, he makes a statement in, at least in John's record. I have to look that up. Um, interesting. Okay. So I guess what I'm, I'm him hawing about here is there are you know, instances. Uh, yeah. Oh, John, if I may, um, yeah, go ahead. He, is, mm -hmm. he is going to deal with that again in John yeah. six, when they ask what sign will you perform? And like the, 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 uh, the feeding the 5,000 where they come back the next day. Yeah. So he kind of deals with it. Not same wording. But but you're only following me because of the signs. Yeah, I was thinking though there was there was another account in Matthew where this statement is used, and that's what um, right. when I did a quick search, I'm not locating it. So right. it doesn't really matter. It, it it could be the same person, could be the same account, could be two different accounts. The point is, is that we see the consistent power of Jesus, whether it be of healing locally healing at a distance. He had the authority to say it is done. And in both cases, both the one in Matthew chapter eight that Brian referenced and this one right here, both instances, the centurion and the nobleman heard that it was the very hour that Jesus said that. The very moment that he said the child or the servant was then made well. Um, any thoughts about that kind so of far? Well, I got a quick question just to hear yeah. what the panel thinks about this. Jesus mm -hmm. says, unless you see miracles, you by no means believe. Do you think that's a criticism of the fact that they don't believe uh, for other reasons? Or do you think that is a testimony of why Jesus needs to perform miracles? I'm just curious what the panel thinks about that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to bring up this point that 
you know, from Exodus chapter 4, Mark 16, verse 20, and even John 3 with the miracle at Cana, clearly the purpose of miracles, as our audience knows, um, it's, it's to confirm the word preached. But it's interesting that sometimes the preaching precedes the miracle, and sometimes the miracle precedes the preaching. Uh, in the book of Acts, I think it's around Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 3, they work the miracle, Peter and John, of healing the man, and that generates the crowd for them to preach, and that gives validity to the message. Uh, but, to, but to Brian's question, I think, it, uh, as I said earlier, I think it could be both. I, I think you have a lot of people in the day of Jesus' ministry who they're treating this as some sort of spectacle that they want to see miracles and only see miracles as Tom alluded to earlier, John six will deal with that. But at the same time, we know from um, Gamaliel's council and acts that there have been a couple of false Christs within the lifetime of the people listening. Mm -hmm. There have been several people claiming to be the Messiah. And so there's another group of people that are probably wanting to see the miracles to distinguish. Are you legitimate? Are you another pretender? So I think Jesus here is probably hitting several different groups at the same time. I think this is an indictment on those who are only wanting to see the miracles. I think he's stating a matter of fact for the people who may be rightly skeptical because of the charlatans and the false prophets who have arisen in their own day. And there's some who it's just a statement of fact that it doesn't matter what he says. Yeah. It's going to be what he does. That's going to be the, the the proof for them. So those are my thoughts. It reminds me a little bit uh, to try to think about what Brian has asked. It reminds me a little bit about Thomas. Um, and when he said, uh, Jesus says to him, after he says, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it on my side. Uh, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas was in my estimation here, considered blessed because he believed upon seeing the evidence. But Jesus' words to him are, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, uh, Brian, I think maybe there is a special blessing or special, I don't know, compliment or uh, what we used to say, attaboy, uh, to those who could could not ha have to have the miracles, but yet saw the other evidence and believed. Uh, but Jesus uh, certainly is not um, disapproving of any who would come to believe. But there was coming a day in which they would have to, rather than see the miracles, they would have to accept the testimony and the things that they saw. And so I, I, I don't know. Maybe I don't. I think Thomas fits in this picture, but. Maybe you disagree. I don't know. I wonder how many people were standing around for this conversation. Because the way, because the way he said it now, like in, in the, the new King James and I, the legacy standard as well, um, italicize the words people, meaning it's just added for the thought there, but it could read, unless you see signs and wonders, you'll by no means believe. You know, if it's just the nobleman that he's talking to, then it's a simple, I would think it was going to be the case. He's acknowledging that they're not, he's not going to believe until he fully sees, but he believed enough to ask. And, and that's the challenging point. He, he, he believed enough to say, would you, would you heal my son? Um, but if other people were standing around, like we've seen in other cases, he would oftentimes would say something because of the people who were around, you know? then I could see that being kind of taking a moment for the Pharisees who were there, you know, unless you see this, you're not going to believe, you know, and then he, he does it. So the only thing I would, I always wonder about is that right before this, he's met a whole group of people that are theoretically hostile to him yeah. and that they all believed the Samaritan village believed because of what he said. Um, so it's kind of interesting that his people demand signs. And this, is, of course, later comes up, uh, not in John, but in the other Gospels, that, you know, you always want to see signs, but you're mm -hmm. still not going to believe. Um, yeah. But but these other people were willing to believe just by what they heard. I've always yeah. thought, wondered if there's a contrast there. Good point. 
I think there is. And, yeah. and there's a note of the miracles, and I think this might apply as well. You know, one time in a Bible class, I got asked, you know, why does Jesus, in some cases, only speak and work the miracle? Other times, he's making, you know, silt and rubbing the guy's eyes, or he's unplugging the ears. And my, my answer has been, you know, on, on statements like this and the miracles is Jesus teaches and works miracles in proportion or to what the person needs. You know, if you have if you have a guy who's deaf, he can't exactly hear Jesus say, your ears be open. But if he comes up to him, puts his fingers in and, and he can hear suddenly, that's he can understand that. Same thing with the guy who's tongue tied, touches the tongue, it's unloosed. And I think sometimes you have statements that hit differently to different people. You know, many times I I was perplexed by the statement uh, about why he taught in parables. Having ears that they cannot hear, having eyes and do not see, lest they turn and and repent. He's quoting from Isaiah 6. Realizing later that mm, the parables are kind of a, a, a litmus test almost of, well, do you want to know the truth? We see the disciples want to know the truth. It's like, hey, we didn't understand this. Could you explain to us? Other people hear that like, oh, I don't get it. Eh, it must not be important. I'm going to move on. And with the miracles, some Jesus refused to work miracles for because their their intent, their their heart condition is, I, I just want to see a sign. Or his own people, as Brian pointed out, just want to keep seeing signs. And it's almost like the lumberjack fallacy. Doesn't matter what sign they work, he, they'll say, "Well, that's not the that's not the sign we're looking for. That's not the right sign." And others need no sign at all, as Brian pointed out. The Samaritans, based on what he taught, or well, what he said, you know, uh, they believed. And I think there's a, a there's a truth factoring moment here for us. The message, and this is the the lesson for the parable of the sower. We could deliver the same Bible study, the same lesson, the same whatever it is, to ten group, different groups of people, ten different people, and you you might get twenty different responses. You just you do not know how the word is going to impact or how it's going to hit. And even then, I have preached. The same lesson at the beginning of my tenure here, middle and recently, it's the same basic outline. The sermon's been a little bit different. It's largely the same audience. They've had three different responses each time I preached it because context, life, all that stuff changes how you receive it. Uh, so just some thoughts there. Yeah, that's a good point. Any thoughts about that? So we've got two comments real quick in the chat room. Um, I'm gonna, there ha- by the way, we've had several comments in the chat room that we didn't bring in. Um, someone's talking about leprechauns and unicorns. Um, and some agreed with Brian. That was very disturbing. And um, <laughs> we actually have several who have wasted this day and I didn't take time to kind of note y'all, but you know who you are. Appreciate you joining us and your thoughts and comments. By the way, if you're on our YouTube side of the world, then be sure to like this video and subscribe if you'd like to receive notifications of future uh, live streams. Also on the Facebook side of things, like and follow, I think is what you have to do over there. But let me go ahead and bring in the comment from David Clark. And I think this is a good one because I've heard this said before and have wondered this very thing myself. David says, it's too bad we don't have miracles today. Then maybe people would believe in the power of Jesus because planting the seed now, nowadays takes a while. And I, I've wondered about that because, and, and well, let me tell you the two different contexts. One, you hear about modern day miracles. I'm thinking, you know, if you can truly heal people and raise the dead, go to the local hospital and start clearing it out. You know, just, just go, you know. Um, but you would think that if, and people would say, if God would just come down before me and talk to me today, and I'm thinking you're going to be dead if he does that, but let's say if he does that, then I'll believe. And I think in the end, the, the reality is they wouldn't believe. Yeah. You know, people in the first century rejected the very miracles they saw and Jesus condemns them for it. Bethsaida, Chorazin, and, um, whichever, uh, the other city there that he, um, he, he condemns because they saw the signs and did not even even um, accept what was being done. 
I don't know if people would believe, even if signs were done today. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, John, uh, uh, just to add to what you said, they didn't just reject the miracles. They rejected Jesus himself. Um, I, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, let, just just let that sink in. Nobody performed more miracles, and nobody was more powerful than Jesus in the miracles that he performed. And they rejected him. Uh, and, and of course, we can't all we cannot also dismiss the purpose of miracles had to do with the confirming of the message. Even Jesus himself taught that, and that was emphasized. So if, if miracles were being performed today, some of the problems you would have is you'd have the same problems Jesus mentions here. Unless you see signs and miracles, you won't believe. Uh, how, you know, how often was there concerns where the only reason they were seeking Jesus was because it was that personal benefit to them? You know, I, 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 I have a sickness. I need to be healed. Okay, I'll turn to Jesus so I can be healed. And and while some might believe because of that, I don't think all will. I, 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 and I, I personally, and this is my personal conviction, the number who would believe only because of a miracle would be minuscule. In other words, in other words, the mindset is is at the foundation. If you believe the Bible is true, you believe miracles existed in the first century and in the Old Testament as needed, confirming the Word of God. So you believe in miracles, but you see they're not needed today because you have the Word of God. The truth is, is the gospel is the only thing that's uh, that reveals the message of God's word. I I also think I also think about charlatans. I mean, I mean, today we have these professed miracle workers, and they always turn it into a show. Yeah, I mean th that's that's really what it becomes. It becomes more about outward than it does inward. And, and by the way, modern day miracle workers, I do not know one of them that teaches the truth. <laughs> you know, yeah. matter of fact, yeah, you know, uh, by de by definition of the fact that they're claiming to do miracles, but but I mean, most of them, most of them fit into the category. And and if you'll pardon me, I just preached this past Sunday on Second Peter chapter two. You know, I started talking about the character of miracle workers and the or not, I mean, false teachers, and the character of the majority of miracle workers today. I know there's some that that believe that are sincere and so on. But the character of the majority of them, they're just in it. They're just in it for the money. So you would you would have those who are really performing miracles if they happen today, and you'd still have the fakes. And the fakes would be exploiting it just like everything else. The bottom line is, is we don't need the miracles today. We need faith. A couple points to add to that. Uh, well, Two clarifying points, and I agree with everything Tom said. One is, I, I think sometimes I myself have found I do this. I make the assumption that there's miracles on every page in the Bible. And really, there isn't. Uh, the period of miracles in the Bible is is very there. There's like three major periods, basically. Yeah. The ministry They're of rare, Moses, Brandon. They yeah, are the, rare the ministry, times. The ministry of Moses. Elijah, and even then Elijah is kind of more about the power of prayer than an actual miracle. And then, and you have the raising of the widow's son, but even then that's prayer. And then you have the ministry of Jesus. And I was reading this this, this morning in my day of the Bible reading, but when Samuel gets called, chapter three and verse one of first Samuel says that the word of the Lord was rare in those days and there was no widespread revelation. You know, they... There, there's pe periods where the people of God are expected to remain faithful even when the prophets weren't speaking. Second point, and I think sometimes I we, we forget this. When we teach rightly, the miracles had a very limited per had a, had a purpose, a limited time. Sometimes people hear that, oh, you don't believe God does anything today. Not true. We teach rightly that miracles through the agency of man has ceased. But God is still God and can do whatever he wants. 
Why do we pray for healing if we don't believe God can heal? Why do we pray for God's intervention uh, if we don't believe God can do it? Why do we pray to God soften people's hearts to obey the gospel if we don't believe he can do it? So when we say that miracles don't happen today, it's through human agency. God can still do whatever he wants. Uh, and he still does, and he still heals and, and strengthens and softens people's hearts. But going to something Tom said earlier, we, if you are predisposed to be skeptical and not believe in God, you're not going to see those things. And it's the C.S. Lewis, I came across a quote from C.S. Lewis recently, and it's really good. He said, the reason why atheists don't find evidence for God is the same reason a burglar doesn't go looking for a cop after he robbed the house. You know, there, there's, you're, that's not what you're looking for. And it's not, we're not talking about confirmation bias here. The evidence is there. So to Tom's points, you know, if miracles happen today, we would have the same issues that we saw in the first century. Simon the Sorcerer would be trying to buy it and come up with knockoffs. You would have people like at Corinth who were basically showing off who could do better miracles and the message was being uh, obscured. You would have uh, those attempting to, as people do today, give fake miracles in order to give credence to themselves, not to the message preached. So while I am in agreement, I would love to see Jesus work miracles. It'd be great. I mean, I, I would love to be there, what we're talking about today, to see this miracle. God in this providence has determined that I don't live there in that time. I live in 21st century America. And so what I've been given is actually a miracle. I, I, I'm going to suggest to our audience that when I hold this, think about this. God has preserved the text for some thousands of years accurately and faithfully that you and I today can pick up our Bibles and know assuredly what the truth is. No other human, no, no human text can attest to that. God's word, and it, it, one last thing, and I'll be quiet. For years, for centuries, our best manuscripts of Isaiah in the Old Testament came from like the 7th century AD. We're talking thousand, a thousand years after they, they were supposedly written. And the skeptics for years said, when we find older manuscripts, they're going to contradict, da, 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 da. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we found a copy of Isaiah from about, I think, two or 300 BC. And it read almost exactly like the copy we have from 700 AD. And when I say almost exactly, there was a few like scribal errors, like they forgot the period or something. What that told the world was, oh, the Bible has been accurately transmitted over thousands of years with almost no variation in the text. So God, I would suggest you, we do have the miracle of God's word in our hands every day. And we need to be using it. Those are my thoughts. Okay. All right. Good point. Good points there with that. Um, we have a couple of the comments real quick. So what we'll do is got a few of the comments we'll bring in um, for real quick discussion. And then we'll probably go ahead and plan to pull the study to a close. That should put us at the top of the hour just about. And at the end of chapter four, unless there's any one bit or two we need to cover before we do that in chapter four. But the next comment, uh, let me go and bring it in. And then, Brian, if you want to, um, see what you have to say about it. This comes in from Day, uh, James Dodson. He writes, how can we condemn those who believe due to signs when that was the purpose of signs? Right. I think that's a great comment. Um, and I certainly, uh, you know, earlier I talked about, you know, you kind of contrast sometimes with Jesus being frustrated that people always expected signs. Um, and, and I think James's point would be the goal is to get people to believe. Now, now that being said, um, I would suggest that there is a there is a sense too where the the purpose of signs are to confirm the idea of belief, but faith comes by hearing the word of God. Um, so we would kind of say that genuine belief is not going to be because of miracles. Miracles are only going to confirm uh, the validity of the things that we're believing. Um, it was mentioned before, and maybe it's worth mentioning again, that one of the the dilemmas is whether or not Jesus could have been accused of working his miracles by the power of Satan. And of course, by one of the unique things he does is cast out demons, which demonstrates, he says, two things. Number one, it demonstrates he, 
he's uh, doing this not by the power of Satan, but by the power of God. And number two, that he has a power over Satan. Um, that when he declares he can overcome Satan, he's actually demonstrating he has that ability. Um, miracles uh, aren't designed so that they foster belief or that they, you know, sp you know, create belief, but they do confirm it. They do give a confirmation of a validity of a person speaking. We see that like in Hebrews chapter two, when the Hebrew writer says, you know, the message is preached, and then he says, and then it's confirmed by the miracles. But our belief is not going to necessarily be created by the miracles. Uh, uh, you know, faith is supposed to be created by hearing the word of God. Um, uh, and I, 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 I so I'm, I'm trying to say I agree with James. I think, uh, I think his point is good that it's, um, we, we wouldn't want to condemn somebody who says, I saw the sign and I believe it. Um, but we would want to be careful to say that it's not belief until they actually hear the message of the word of God. That's the definition Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 tells us. And that's, really <clears throat> one of the contrasts that Jesus says a lot. We have a lot of people that just hear Jesus. They don't see any miracles and they believe. We have a lot of people that see miracles but don't believe Jesus. Um, the the concept of belief, and this is, um, I hope this isn't controversial to say, but this is something I think we need to uh, appreciate about belief. Belief is a choice. Um, we we believe because we're making a choice that, that we're going to say, I believe, um, yeah. In part because we say we want it to be true. I, I would say that that's part of it as well. But but all belief is a choice. And it's important for us to acknowledge the idea that when we say I can't believe, it's not because there's been a failure of I information to convict us. It's because we've made a choice. Yeah. And part of the reasons why I believe the teachings of Jesus is because I believe the records of the miracles that he did. You know, they're just as real today as far as in my mind as they were back then. And so they go to confirm what he taught. Yeah. 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 You know, John, when I, if somebody were to ask me today, and, and this is an important point to understand. If somebody were to ask me today, do you believe in miracles? My answer to that would be absolutely. I just don't believe in miracles today. And it's not, and, and it's like Brendan said, it's not because God can't do it. But um, it's just what he chose to do. But he still works today, providentially. All righty. Uh, we may have to stop the study, study earlier. The people at home and probably the guys in the Zoom looks like I've frozen up. Yeah. Do I seem to be... Stay, I, we I'm do stable. hear you. Um, yeah, I will right. say this. It's a, it's a great picture of you frozen. So if you just want to keep talking... I think we're well, going to enjoy it. I tell you what, because John, of... Paul, let go it go. Let it go. <laughs> You're frozen. <laughs> okay. I tell you what, I want to bring in the rest of the comments real quick. Um, I, can, I can at least read those. And we are just about out of time. But um, <laughs> let's start next with um, Danielle's comments. And we'll kind of walk these through here real quick. She says, uh, just like with Lazarus and the rich man, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, why would they listen to someone back from the dead? That's a good point. Um, Aline, she says, the signs and miracles convinced the apostles and many early disciples who laid the groundwork of the church with the testimony of cruel deaths. Okay, all right, good point. And um, Caleb throws in there also, also, there we go. Also the confirmation of the apostles teachings. That's exactly right. Why should they listen to them? Because they knew by the miracles that the message was from God. And then David Clark, he says, are there more false teachers than preachers that speak the truth? I think there at times there could be more false teachers than those who teach the truth. Even when some of the things they say are biblically accurate in the end, the sum of what they're doing is that of a false teacher. Uh, Caleb, he says, signs, wonders, and miracles in tongues all were used until the Bible was completed and the, perf and the perfect was completed and revealed. After you have the Bible, you don't need anything else to confirm. And then I think that's probably the rest of it as far as outside our discussion there. Um, any thoughts or comments about that? Okay. All right. Now I'm going to do one thing and I'm back. There we go. Oh, that's so much better. Um, any other <laughs> thoughts or comments? <laughs> we try Zoom not to weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no one's no one's rejoicing with me that I'm back. Okay. All right. Yeah, you know, I, I last comment, John, is just to say this. You know, yeah. 
one of the things about the woman at the well and Jesus' disciples, all the people were, were laid for, they're all looking for this ahead of time. They were all thinking, you know what, I'm yeah. looking for this Messiah. And what it comes down to is they say, I want to believe in Jesus, but I need to have it verified. But it, but it again comes down to this idea that this is what they wanted. This is what they were looking for. Um, and whenever Jesus comes to the Pharisees and them, this, this is not what we're looking for. You know, you are not the Messiah we want. And it's kind of ironic that the same miracles can be seen by both. And for some, they say, well, it confirms that I know what I'm believing. For others, it's a, well, you know, it has no value to me at all. Yeah. And one more note about this miracle with the nobleman, kind of looking at the very end of it there. And he himself believed in his whole household. There were instances where people came to Jesus, especially Matthew's account. And he says, your faith has made you whole. All right. And I look at that as saying their belief was so strong that that's why they came to him. They came to him believing. In this case in point, it does indicate that maybe his coming to him wasn't, wasn't the same level of faith as we've seen in others, but it was enough as a seed that's planted maybe that once this was, and he saw the completion of it, that he and his household fully believed. Again, just goes back to everyone believes differently as far as at what level, at what point in their learning process. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? There are a lot of different things that have come to mind as we go through the study, and we really don't want to um, go farther, uh, go longer. But I just got, I had, had someone years ago who made the interesting point about providence and how God works in our life. We often think about God working in our life as Christians. We look for those and we see what we believe to be moments of providence. But what about the person who looks back to before their conversion? 10 years ago, they met someone because they got fired at a job, they got hired at another job, and at this new job, they began to work with someone who is a member of the church. And this person began to teach them. And then they eventually obeyed the gospel. And that person thanks the Lord for them getting fired from their job so they would get the new job to meet this person. Well, this is the person thanking the Lord for his providential work in their life before they became a Christian. It's interesting. Yeah, interesting discussion. And with that, we're out of time. <laughs> Any other thoughts? All right, listen, I appreciate everyone joining us today. Appreciate you guys here with us. Tell, we'll tell Bob that we missed him and hopefully see him back next time. And Brinson, Brendan, will we be blessed to have your present with us next week? I hang on it. <laughs> What'd you say? You're not going to bet on it? I said I'm planning on it. We'll planning on it. Okay. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> All righty. Well, listen, let's say, let's plan to be back here again next, next Thursday at 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock AM central time. We'll pick up here with John chapter five, verse one. If there's anything we missed, we can step back and look at it, but we'll plan to officially begin John chapter five, verse one. And look at that instance there. When you go back there, look at it again at the conversation about the waters at that well and what took place there, what type of miracle he was expecting. We'll kind of discuss that a little bit next week. So, all right, thanks everyone. We'll see you then next week. Have a wonderful week.